because um, I'm, I'm taking this opportunity to try to drill down into um, the Medicare hospice benefit and to try to convey not only what a physician needs to know uh, in order to uh, function within the Medicare system, the Medicare hospice system, but also to try to capture some of the nuances of the benefit so that the benefit can be used in the service of doing palliative care in any venue. Let me just say that again because I really think that's a very important lesson that I've learned personally. S since I, I grew up in, pal personally, grew up in palliative care not from hospice but from cancer pain, um, I'm unusual in the United States and I didn't personally appreciate the, the scope and the depth of the Medicare hospice benefit until about eight, ten years ago. And then in the last eight or ten years, I have been on a constant journey to try to understand the nuances of the benefit uh, at a leadership level in the organizations with which I've been interacting so that the benefit can be used in the service of palliative care. Um, I think that there is now a very broad understanding in the U.S. that hospice provides a mechanism to provide specialist level palliative care at the end of life. And that itself has been a tremendous change from the original um, uh, conceptualization of the Medicare hospice benefit 25 years ago. But in the last 10 years, hospice providers, including the leadership of hospice organizations around the country and the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization, has bought into this concept that hospice, when it's done well with high quality, provides a means to provide specialist level palliative care at the end of life and therefore could potentially play this very important role in an effort to provide specialist level palliative care throughout the full trajectory of any life limiting illness. Okay, does that concept make sense? Because it was, a, it was an epiphany for me because coming, coming from the non-hospice world I had a lot of misunderstandings about hospice and then when I first got into hospice and I understood the, uh, the variation in the agencies in the U.S. in terms of their ability to provide quality, I didn't automatically uh, embrace the concept that here was something that could be used well. So it took me a little time to, to understand that if you demand from hospice quality palliative care, it is a, it is a perfect opportunity to, um, to, to provide specialist level palliative care at the end of life and to use it in the service of a broader model of palliative care that might originate in hospitals or in home care agencies or anywhere else. Okay? And, and so I think that that's a, that's a very important point not just for providers but also for regulators and for, and for payers generally. Um, hospice has tremendous potential if it's used optimally vis-a-vis -vis the restraints of the benefit and also if, you, if, if providers who work in hospice insist on excellence, insist on quality. Now having said that, it is not easy. It is not easy for a, 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 a trainee in the professions to understand this whole separate healthcare system because that's what hospice in the U.S. has been. It grew up 25 years ago after a 10-year genesis as an entirely separate healthcare system in the United States, separated from, siloed from mainstream medicine. And that was done purposefully. The original people who fought very hard for the creation of a hospice Medicare benefit didn't want it to be in mainstream medicine. They wanted it to be outside of mainstream medicine in order to protect the services from over-medicalization of the dying process. The original hospice philosophy, which was brought from the UK to here by some pioneers in the field and then, who then became advocates with the government to try to create this benefit, felt that the goal was to provide the opportunity for a dignified death at home. The concept was to pursue the good death in the home environment. That was, that was the concept that was brought from the UK to the United States. And in an effort to do that, the idea was keep it out of hospitals and keep it away from doctors. And so the entire structure of the Medicare hospice benefit 
um, originated from the idea that this would be a separate healthcare system away from mainstream medicine. So the good news in that regard is that it has been a highly successful um, process and, um, and it has grown rapidly from literally nothing to, um, to services that are now accessed by about 30% of patients who die each year in the United States, about 1.4 million patients and families. It's now a 12 or $14 billion benefit under Medicare. So it, it has grown rapidly in this siloed uh, conceptualization. That's the good news. But the bad news is that those of us who don't work in it full time and instead are trying to use it in the service of providing specialist level palliative care at the end of life within a broader model of palliative care nationally, we have to understand this whole separate health care system down to its nuances in order to use it well. And also, in order to stay in compliance. It's highly regulated, it's carefully audited, and the federal government has had it up to here in terms of perceived fraud and abuse. So as we're going into 2011 and beyond, compliance issues are going to become even more prominent than they have been, involving both, uh, both uh, 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 civil law and criminal law. So it is very essential that everybody who's working in hospice has some understanding about, how, about what compliance means. So I want everybody around the table, um, as, as long as they last, to take what I've distributed here. The, I, I'm not into wasting paper, but I really felt that everybody who comes to this lecture and everybody who gets trained in this department at some point is going to have to sit down and read this large packet. And so I wanted you to have an opportunity to read it on the plane, going off to wherever you're flying to, uh, maybe nighttime reading. But this large packet here, 73 pages, is the Medicare conditions of participation. These are the rules for hospice under the Medicare benefit. Right? There was a, they were recently revised a couple of years ago, first revision in 25 years, and, and um, I view this as required reading for physician fellows and nurse practitioner fellows and social work fellows and psychology postdocs and everybody else doing palliative care. This piece of this document is just for fun. Uh, this came off the NHPSCO website and just gives you a history of hospice starting uh, in 1965 and actually even before that in the UK. And so this hopefully will provide a historical perspective and and suggest that this healthcare system has actually evolved in a very dynamic way um, and has changed a lot from the beginning till now. But most people in mainstream medicine don't know that because it's outside of mainstream medicine. So when you encounter somebody, a colleague or a patient or family member, misconceptions about this system are huge, uh, despite the fact that it has grown like wildfire and actually has evolved in a, in a way to support quality. Uh, these two documents um, are, are um, ones that you might just glance at and then toss if you want. One is an NHPCO tip sheet for physicians based on the new COPS. So when the conditions of participation changed for the first time, there were some specific changes that affected physicians, and that's what this is. And then this one is a document that was prepared by some consultants to do quality and compliance audits of a large hospice program. And I read this and I felt that it was the best compilation of the key elements of compliance that I've ever seen. And because it's short and it's, it's um, focused on compliance issues that most pro healthcare professionals don't think about, I thought that I would include this. So this gives you a sense of the rules that are incorporated in this document and that have to be um, adhered to by every hospice agency in the country, every certified hospice agency. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about hospice. What I want to do is I want to talk about the history a little bit. Then I want to provide you with an overview as someone um, who is on the medical side might see it. Um, so I, I'd like to try to highlight some really important take-home messages, again, with the goal of thinking about hospice in the service of palliative care, special level palliative care at the end of life. 
Then I want to talk about the role of the physician. And then I want to talk about the economics. And then if we have time at the end, I will walk you through the cops and point out some of the phrases and um, descriptions that provide the substance to these rules of the road. Okay? Any questions or comments about the goals, the agenda? Okay. So, as I talked about before, hospice grew up as a separate health care system in the United States, and it was, uh, it was finally passed into law after about 10 years of work in about 1982. And, um, and then subsequently was expanded from Medicare to Medicaid. And the Medicare and the Medicaid hospice benefits are basically identical. And uh, these are federal benefits that are, um, that are in federal statute and set up a separate health care system. The system was set up as the first managed care organization in the United States, meaning to say that the system was set up so that patients who were eligible would be certified as eligible, come into the system, and then the agency taking care of them would get a per diem payment for the care of the patient to provide a range of services. The agencies would take on full risk. So this is called full risk capitation in 2010. Back then, I'm not even sure that that's how it was called. It was very innovative, but it was called, but today we would call it full risk capitation related to the terminal illness. The, the, the hospice benefit covers payments only related to the terminal illness and only for those patients who are eligible by the regs and elect the benefit. Now, there's a very important issue here, and that is that it's actually an entitlement. The way it is structured in the federal regulations is exactly the way Social Security is, is uh, structured and Medicare, uh, the other, uh, the, the full range of Medicare services are structured. This is an entitlement. So the Medicare hospice benefit is a Part A benefit. It's a Part A benefit like dialysis, uh, like rehabilitation services. It's a Part A benefit. And it is... Um, uh, and it requires patients to turn over the Part A benefit to which they're entitled with respect to the terminal illness to the hospice agency, okay? So that's a very important point. So that means that every patient in the United States, every person in the United States who is 65 years old or is receiving Social Security benefits, uh, receiving Medicare as a result of disability, for example, any one of those patients and patients who are indigent and are receiving Medicaid can elect this uh, benefit if they meet the medical eligibility. And in electing it, they sign a, an, a, an election of benefits document called an EOB. And by signing an EOB, they turn over their Part A benefits to the hospice agency, which then bills for those services. They're only with respect to the Ill illness that's designated as the terminal illness. So if a patient has another illness, that means that the, um, uh, the, the reimbursements for care, hospitalization, for example, or other services will go through the usual Part A and Part, a, Part B system and Part D system for drugs, right? But if it's related to the terminal illness, everything will go through the, the uh, Medicare hospice benefit. Okay. By the way, I was another epiphany for me in my in my youth, like three four months ago, was um, was the recognition that physicians who um, who peremptorily decide that patients are not ready to hear about hospice are actually denying an entitlement from a patient, and it is um, an egregious act comparable to a social service worker, for example, not informing a 65-year-old that he or she's entitled to Social Security benefits. So the decision that's made to, to, to not tell a patient or family that this entitlement exists because of a, a view that uh, they're not ready to hear it um, is actually, um, to me, um, not a, it's, an, it's an act of commission. It is, a, it, is an, a, it is a decision on the part of a health professional that denies an entitlement from a patient. So if you're going to deny a, a patient's knowledge about an entitlement, you better have a very, very strong rationale for that. 
And as, as you all know by this point, there's so much misconception about the hospice benefit that you have to be concerned that patients are being denied information about this benefit because of a misunderstanding about what it offers. Okay. So, and then the, the other last prefatory thing I want to say about the entitlement issue is that people who now work in hospice are, many of them, at least the leadership nationally, is striving very hard to reconceptualize the goals of hospice from the concept of the good death or the good death at home to rather the concept of providing comprehensive care for advanced, advanced serious and life-threatening illness. So if you think about the benefit as, as an entitlement program established by the government for the provision of comprehensive services to patients with advanced illness, it becomes much clearer that everybody with advanced illness should at least know that this benefit is out there. And it should also become clearer that uh, patients don't have to accept that they're dying. They don't have to accept that they have no more care for their illness. We'll talk more about that in a second. They don't have to accept anything except to, make, to be clear that they become eligible for these services provided by the government at no cost to them at a certain point when they're eligible, and that can be explained to patients. And then this is an entitlement program to provide comprehensive care. For a while, you know, those of us who are interested in advocating for hospice, advocating for palliative care, thought that the words palliative care would take hold in our culture in the United States and that it would become much easier to talk about hospice because hospice would be explained as the means to provide specialist level palliative care at the end of life or specialist level palliative care when the disease reaches a certain point. But unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be much movement in establishing an understanding of palliative care either. So, so we have trouble with words in the United States, and hospice is clearly a very stigmatized word. And palliative care seems to be coming to be stigmatized to a lesser extent, but around the same set of issues, right? Um, death and dying are very poor social marketing terms in the United States. You know, they just don't get people turned on. And so hospice's link to death and dying has really been a big problem. Okay, so let's talk about eligibility. What are the, what's the eligibility for the hospice benefit? Does anybody know? Beyond being eligible for Medicare or Medicaid. Or you can be eligible for hosp the hospice benefit under uh, various commercial carriers, but they're set up completely separate from the federal benefit, right? So if, if I have Empire Blue Cross Blue Shield, there's a hospice benefit under there. If I'm sick, I should read my policy. I shouldn't assume that all of the all of the benefits that flow from the government under the Medicare and Medicaid hospice benefit are included in my Empire Blue Cross Blue Shield policy. But if I am eligible for either Medicare or Medicaid, then, uh, then I might be eligible for these benefits if I have what criteria? Anybody know the criteria? Advanced illness, uh, where you can, I mean, under normal circumstances, you can kind of certify that patient has uh, expectancy, life expectancy less than six months. Right, so, so one issue is that there has to be a terminal illness, and that terminal illness has to be deemed by two physicians, one of whom is a contracted physician, one of whom is an employed physician of the hospice. And that, and that physician is the final gatekeeper in determining whether or not the patient's condition is, um, is such that the patient would be expected to die within six months from the disease if it runs its expected course. Okay? So the first... The, the first and most important eligibility criterion is a terminal illness that is expected to uh, take the life of the patient within six months if it runs its usual course. And that has to be certified on initial eligibility by an attending physician who is not employed by the hospice, the hospice if one exists, if one, if one has been designated by the patient. But most importantly, the gatekeeper, the person who says yay or nay, is an employed physician of the hospice. Okay. What's the second criterion? Uh, 
The second criterion in the federal regulations is election. So the patient or the patient's representative has to say they want to turn over the Part A benefits. So think about that. That's it. That's it. That's all the government demands. Government demands a progressive incurable illness deemed by medical professionals as likely to take the life of the patient, more likely than not is what the legal standard is, more likely than not to take the um, life of the patient within six months if it runs its usual course, and the patient has to say, I want the benefit. Does the, does the law say anywhere about the patient giving up all disease-modifying therapy? No. The, the, laws, the federal regulation says something about curative therapy. And what do you think the law means by the word curative? Or better yet, since you don't know what the law means, what do you mean by the word curative? Huh? Just goal. So by, by goal to cure, you would mean, would you mean that the evidence that exists would either suggest that the treatment has the potential to cure or not cure? Because if that were the case, every chemotherapy for any stage 4 neoplasm would be non-curative. Ah, boy, that's really interesting. Do you really think that? That's really, really interesting. The reason, the reason I'm... What's that? In just a provocative way. I think you're trying to provoke me. <laughs> I think that's really very, very interesting. So the reason, the reason to think about this is because the regulation used the word curative, and hospice agencies since 1982 have chosen to view the word curative as equal to disease-modifying even though the vast majority of disease-modifying therapies, primary therapies for life-threatening complications or therapies for the disease itself, the vast majority of them don't cure people. The, people remain, the patients remain sick. Patients with stage 4 cancer continue to have stage 4 cancer. Patients with cirrhosis continue to have cirrhosis. Patients with ALS continue to have ALS. Patients with Alzheimer's continue to have Alzheimer's. But there are disease-modifying therapies that might be used either to ch in the intent of trying to re improve local control of the tumor so, or local control of the disease so the patient has fewer symptoms or prolonging life. But medical professionals know they're not curative because cure is not possible. Alzheimer's patients don't get cured. ALS is not a curable illness. So the word curative, if it's defined as curative, truly, excludes almost nothing. The benefit in the law excludes almost nothing because there are very few things that are curative. When Gleevec, the antineoplastic drug Gleevec, came out for gastrointestinal stromal tumors, it was, to me, a, a, an emblematic um, event in the history of hospice eligibility because here patients all around the country, patients were dying of GIST, they were dying of it. And then they got this drug called Gleevec, and the, disease, and the disease melted away. And from the early studies, it was very likely that they were either cured or had a long survival. So the availability of that drug meant that the patients were no longer eligible for hospice. Now, what if you have a drug or a treatment that's more likely than not, given the medical science, to prolong life for six months? Is that drug, is that another definition for the word curative? If you define curative within the framework of the benefit? So since you guys can't read my mind, I'll just tell you what I'm thinking. Because I spent a lot of time thinking about this as, as we try to create a system called open access hospice and then we watched it fail on the, because of the economic considerations. The reality of the world is that the Medicare hospice benefit was set up as a managed care benefit with per diem rates 
that were quite low relative to the services that had to be provided. Most hospices in the country lose money. Not anymore, most hospices, until, until most hospices became for-profit hospices about five years ago, most hospices were losing money. The not-for-profit hospices often lose money, the small ones all lose money. Hospices less than 50 patients, which is the most, most common not-for-profits, all lose money. So the Medicare benefit per diem rates were set up relatively low for the, for the degree of the services mandated by the regs. So as a result of that, since the law says that all of the treatments for the terminal illness have to be included in the full risk capitation, and hospices were therefore required to provide all of the drugs related to the terminal illness that were considered within their scope of practice, hospices during the 80s and the 90s deemed that any drug that was a primary disease modifying drug was curative and therefore excluded by the regulations. Even though, even back then, it didn't apply in any logical way. The drugs, the medicines for these diseases are not curative. Right? Memantine for Alzheimer's doesn't cure it. Rylatec for ALS doesn't cure it. Cisplatinum for lung cancer doesn't cure it. And yet the t all these treatments were considered curative and therefore could be excluded by the hospices. And the, fed the federal regulators went along with that even though on the face of it, it was illogical because it was an economic necessity. The important point to remember, um, so that's one reality. A second reality is that the regulations make it clear that whenever a patient has a life expectancy that is expected to be more than six months by the medical director, that patient is no longer eligible. Right? So, if there is a treatment for the primary disease that is more likely than not to extend life for six months, that patient must come off hospice. That's the Gleevec story. So, the word curative in the federal regs could be defined as any treatment that is more likely than not based on medical science to prolong life for six months or more. If a treatment has that as a, as a likelihood based on the evidence, not based on what patients say, because patients say stuff that has nothing to do with the evidence. So if that is true, then you could call that curative. Uh, that would be a label that would then make sense under the regs, even though the word curative still wouldn't make any sense. It should be called sufficiently life-prolonging or ineligibility-making, but it shouldn't be called curative. But at least that would make sense. The concept that all disease-modifying therapies are, are excluded under the benefit is simply not true. When you hear that from hospice providers, when you leave, when those of you who are going to be working with agencies get out there and you hear that we don't do curative therapies, in a very, very gentle way, and it will probably take you several years, try to get the leadership of your hospice to understand that what they're saying makes no sense, is not required by the federal regulation, and at least be honest about it. Because unless we're honest about it, you can never go to the government and say, this, this, we have to have outlier benefits for, for selected groups of patients. We have to have some mechanism for providing this treatment because it's the standard of care. It's provided within two weeks of death. And if you exclude curative therapies across the board, patients won't get the benefit until two weeks before death. So the only way the patient can get the benefit is if you pay for this other therapy upstream from that which you will not do if you call it curative and hospice agencies say they don't cover it. Right? Okay. So the bottom line is that there are two, there are two eligibility criteria in the regs. Terminal illness with a life expectancy of six months or less if it runs its expected course as deemed by the medical director with support from the attending physician, if available. And number two, the patient elects the benefit. Patient or the patient's representative elects the benefit. Most hospices interpret the word representative as meaning family. Um, the cops actually don't use the word family. They use the word representative. It's unfortunate that they don't use the word surrogate. So no one knows what representative is. And depending on where you are around the country and whether or not there are ethics reviews and that sort, sort of thing, some programs will allow patients without families to access the benefit. Most will not, though. Okay. 
How does hospice work in terms of the processes of care? Right. So the answer to that is no, unless you have a policy and a procedure that has been vetted by the organization. And actually, the safest way to have this is a policy that's been approved by the hospice board of trustees, board of directors. We, um, in our prior hospice, continuum hospice care, we had a policy that was approved by the ethics committee, provided a procedure for bringing people in. It involved a due diligence search for the family a review by an ethics subcommittee, and that policy was approved by the board, and we implemented it. We will have that going forward, but right now we do not have that yet in our current hospice program. So the answer is no, we shouldn't put those people on the hospice. Okay, how do the, benefits period, how do the benefit periods work? Suppose the patient has a lung cancer metastatic to bone, and the patient has been getting um, a platinum-based chemotherapy and, and um, paclitaxel and um, a biological agent, and the disease progressed through that, and now the patient has um, opted not to get any more chemo, understands that the next chemo has a 10% chance of a partial response. There were a lot of side effects with the first group of chemos, and the patient says, I don't want any more chemo. Um, so the patient is now, set, but the patient does have a bony, painful bony lesion. The patient wants radiation. Is that patient eligible for hospice? Yes. So that patient is eligible for hospice. Could the hospice program provide the radiation under the law? Yes. But if the hospice program provided the radiation, the hospice program would be responsible for paying for the radiation. And many hospice programs, including our own, would say, well, the way the healthcare system is set up, get your radiation under existing Part A benefit or Part B, and then we'll take you into our Part A benefit. That's because once a person elects the hospice, it is capitated, full risk. Right, which is different than the fee-for-service model than the rest of Medicare. So if you think about it, there's a fairness issue. I have no problem with hospice programs doing a financial analysis as part of the care process because they need to survive to provide care. If they don't survive, there's a justice issue. You can bankrupt all the hospices of less than 100 people in the United States. You'll go from a current 4,600 hospices down to probably less than half that. You'll provide reduced access, and so that's not right. So hospices do have to do a financial analysis. And in our hospice here, even though we have a large hospice program, we, our analysis would be Medicare has set up a fee-for-service system upstream from hospice, a full-risk capitation system for hospice benefit. The, the radiation is going to take you 10 days. So get your radiation first, and then we'll take you. I personally, you might have a problem with that. I can understand that. It's something to be discussed, but I don't have a problem with that. The, 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 the moral principle, the ethics uh, of that really relate to justice, distribution of health care resources. Because if we provide radiation to everybody who's sick, we'll be bankrupt. We'll have to go out of business. So, so, the, um, that, so that kind of patient would be eligible for hospice. And how does the hospice benefit periods work? The patient has to sign an EOB, and the physician, the, the medical director, and the attending has to sign a CTI, Certification of Terminal Illness. Right? And so until the Certification of Terminal Illness and the EOB is signed, when the EOB is signed, the patient has elected the benefit. Until the CTI is signed, the hospice cannot bill. But the hospice, the EOB uh, it is not legal until there's verbal certification. So it requires verbal certification for the EOB to be activated. But the hospice can't bill until there's actually a written CTI. 
So the, so the patient will sign on, and do you know how the benefit periods work? Certification and recertification. Mm -hmm. So there's... The first one is 90, mm -hmm. and then every 60. No, 290s, and then it's every 60. So there's 290-day 290, 290 benefits, and then an unlimited number of 60-day benefits. Each benefit period after the first requires recertification by an employed physician, by a hospice medical director or a designee, right? Each one. And beginning in February 2011, within 30 days of each benefit period, after the, at 180 days and, 30, and 60 days every, every period thereafter, within 30 days of each of those milestones, the patient will need to be seen either by a physician or an NP in a face-to-face -face encounter, and there will be need to be written documentation justifying the continued eligibility. That's a big change that was placed, put into effect by the government to try to reduce fraud, abuse, and misuse of the benefit. The, the signing of the CTI must be done by a physician. The face-to-face -face visit within 30 days of the milestone can be done either by a physician or an NP. Okay? And if the NP does it, the NP is doing it in the stead of an attending physician, of a, of a medical director, of a physician, and he or she has to discuss the case, and then the physician has to write a narrative and sign the CTI. All of the CTIs now in the United States have a narrative. That's another change to try to reduce fraud and abuse. So every certification has to, be, has to have a written narrative justifying eligibility. And every certification from 180 days through infinity now requires a face-to-face -face encounter. Now that's a huge change in hospices because you can imagine that Ho small hospices in rural areas that service these huge areas and they, they employ physicians very part-time. Now they suddenly have to get physicians on a per diem basis or they have to imp increase their employment of these physicians in order to get them out or NPs in order to get them out into the community. One of the huge quality issues of hospice, one of the reasons that mainstream doctors like myself um, took a long time or are taking a long time to recognize how vibrant and important the benefit is, is because historically, hospice programs would employ physicians for really minimal amounts of time, two, four, six hours per week. All the physician input would be from the community-based physicians who knew nothing about palliative care. The employed physician designated as the HMD himself or herself would have no requirements for credentials in palliative care. So you had the blind leading the blind on the medical side. You, you would have incredibly skilled nursing, potentially, not always, with very little quality, um, uh, quality assurance and quality improvement activity in hospice programs. So there was no effort to ensure that the nursing was high quality, the social work was high quality, pastoral care was high quality, none of that. And the physician component, if you believe that palliative care has a strong component of palliative medicine, it was remarkable to think that, the, that even the designated expert in these programs might never see a patient and might only be there to sign CTIs and, and office notes and to provide bills. Um, and, and that was the, the scope of it. So there was a huge quality, there still is, a huge quality issue in hospices, somewhat related to resources and somewhat related to the way the benefit was set up. And now the new cops are really working to try to change that. One more thing about eligibility, and then we're going to gallop along here. Um, Medicare has established fiscal intermediaries in the United States. The fiscal intermediaries are legally charged with ensuring that the billing, that billing is done honestly and money flows through them. The fiscal intermediary, for example, in New York is National Government Services, whose offices are in Minnesota. And each fiscal intermediary establishes guidelines for how they're going to view hospice eligibility. The guidelines are called LCDs, Local Coverage Determinations. 
The local coverage determinations vary from FI to FI. That's an important thing to recognize. All of you, I think, got, or at least the physicians here, got the small handout with the LCDs. You have to recognize two important things. One important thing is that the LCDs are not mandatory. Even if the FI says it's mandatory, the regulations don't say it's mandatory. You know? So the FI has interpreted the regulations in an effort to try to prevent fraud and abuse by creating these descriptions of patients that designate the patients as sick enough to warrant hospice services. That's what the LCDs are. The local coverage determinations are the characteristics of different diagnoses that mean the diagnoses are advanced enough to warrant hospice. What the regs say is that it's a physician judgment. And even the LCDs, if you read the LCDs for our FI, for example, it talks about comorbidities as needing to be considered in every case. And it provides two separate avenues for eligibility, one that uses the LCDs and one that uses evidence of progression of disease, apart from the LCDs. I can tell you from my own personal experience, testifying in front of administrative law judges to try to get billing approved after the FI has disapproved it, I've done about 300 testimonies and I have won 95% because when an ALJ has to use these regulations and here's why the medical judgment was that the patient is still eligible, 95% of the time, at least when I argue the cases, 95% of the time the ALJs agree. They disagree with the FI, with National Government Services, they agree with me. Because National Government Services has our records reviewed by nurses who, have, who may not be able to get from the record what the clinical judgment was. And they may be looking to see whether or not there's strict adherence to the LCDs. But strict adherence to the LCDs is not required. Okay? So that's just important. When you guys are out there, the physicians among you are out there, and you're being asked, is this person eligible for hospice? And you, you see uh, you know, a patient with um, uh, CHF whose uh, EF is uh, 25% and not 20%, you don't say the patient's not eligible because the EF is 25%. Or this patient, when this patient loses another 5% of the EF, he's eligible for hospice. Right? That's absurd. Right? That's absurd. But that's what you'll see. Sometimes some organizations I've seen have checklists, and it says patient must have, and then it has EF of 20%. Well, that, you know, doesn't matter. The patient, the patient could be profoundly cachectic. Five hospitalizations in the last six months for sepsis. Uh, stage four non-healing decubiti. And if the EF is not 20%, they're ineligible. It's absurd, right? So, so it's a clinical judgment. Okay. Patients can get out of... Patients, once they elect, they can revoke at any time. They can revoke at any time. It is never appropriate in my, my judgment, I'm having discussions about this now, that's so why I'm laughing. It's never appropriate in my, in my judgment to, to make people revoke. So I call that forced revocation. So patients are told, for example, well, if you want that treatment, you'll have to revoke your benefit. So that's, that's not legal. So we should never force a revocation. If a treatment is out of our scope, we can discharge. Why can patients be discharged? They can be discharged if they move out of the area. They can be discharged if they, uh, um, something changes and they'll have a life expectancy of greater than six months. Uh, so if they don't no longer meet eligibility, they can be discharged for, um, for gross abuse. In other words, if they are violent, we're allowed to discharge them. It's often not known that the benefit was set up with caps. So there are two kinds of caps. One kind of cap we do deal with is in, in New York, and that is the amount of the, the number of hospice days across the agency that patients can be inpatients. Does anybody know what that is? This is a common myth, right? I mean, if you go out there on the floor and you say to patients, you know, what's hospice? You know, they, they think that hospice, they still do, think hospice is a place in the community where the dying go, right? So that's not what it is. It's a home care program that allows access to institutions. The access to an inpatient stay for the agency overall is limited to 20% of the days. 
Hospice programs must take care of 80% of routine home care and no more, at least 80% of routine home care, no more than 20% CIP. We'll talk about that in a second. The other cap is a cap on the total amount of money that an agency is allowed to get. Did, every, did, did everybody know that this existed? This blows my mind. So the federal government said back in 1980-something that um, they would not pay an agency more than an average of something like $6,500 per patient. It's gone up a lot now. It's like 19000 or $21,000 per patient, something like that. So, so, the, the, so actually, there are agencies with very, very long lengths of stay in which the payment by the government exceeds the cap, the cap being the, the amount, whatever that is, $19,000, whatever, times the number of patients in the, uh, on an annual basis. And there have been agencies in the country that have had to pay back millions of dollars to the government. I don't know why that cap was placed there. It's, been very, it, it's rarely invoked. For the not-for-profit hospices like ours never get even close to the cap. It's only the for-profit hospices that get close. No, it, it, it came under the benefit in the 80s, in the 80s. It was part of the original benefit. In 1982, included the cap. So, um, so that's just something to know about. I mean, if you happen to leave New York, for, for those of you who are leaving New York and you're going to work for one of the large for-profit hospices, more than half of the hospice patients in the United States now are managed by for-profit hospices. For-profit hospices have been under the gun in the United States because... They, their margins of profit, some of them are very high, as high as 20%, whereas the profit margin for, for large for-profits are running in the range of 2 to 8%, not-for-profits are running in the range of 2 to 8%, and the small non-profits generally lose money. The small not-for-profits generally lose money. So the for-profits are under the gun, and that's why the federal government will probably be changing the reimbursement system soon in order to try to reduce payments. They, they, they will maintain high payments early in the course of the election of hospice and toward the end of life, and then reduce the per diem during the middle time in an effort to try to discourage very long length of stay patients at nursing homes. Um, that's, that's, uh, if, so if you, if you go to a hospice, a, a, a for-profit hospice, out there in the Midwest somewhere with 1,000 patients, 70% uh, of which are in nursing homes, you and your CEO might be discussing the cap. You know, what are we going to do about the cap? In New York, you'll never discuss it. Okay, what are the requirements of the benefit? So if I elect hospice, what does the law say I get? What are the core services? What are the professional core services by law? Professional management by whom? Nurses, Nurses, Nurses right? Workers. Say it again. Okay, so what the regs actually say is that the four core professional services are physician services, nurse services, medical social work, and what they call counseling. Counseling includes spiritual care counseling, but it also includes bereavement support. Um, now, most hospices have elected to view the counseling requirement as meaning pastoral care as a core, part of the core interdisciplinary team. In fact, that's probably everyone. But what the regs actually say is that they put that into a larger framework called counseling. What else is included in the benefit? So you have to have professional management by an interdisciplinary team that consists of those, at least those four people, those four specialties. Yeah. yeah, so DME, supplies, and all drugs and biologicals related to the terminal illness. What else? Care planning. I don't know how they say it, but you have to meet and plan. Right, so professional management that leads to a coordinated care plan. But in terms of the services provided, 
We have physician, nurse, social worker, counseling, including pastoral care included. We have what other people have to be involved or have to be available. Volunteers, Volunteers mandated by law. Isn't that interesting? There's no other benefit in healthcare in the United States that mandates volunteers. It's the only one. Is it mandated that they do? They have to volunteer. <laughs> but they mandate that they have to be trained. So it, the law says you have to train them, and then what law says you have to have them. Very interesting, right? Home health aides, mandated. Right? Access to dietary guidance, access to speech and swallow guidance, access to physical therapy and and occupational therapy. If you can't provide access to these things, you have to get a waiver from the government. But you can't get a waiver for the core services, physician, nurse, social worker, pastoral care. That's required. And how about inpatient uh, unit availability? Yes. Can we get a waiver on so you have to provide access to all the levels of care. So what are the four levels of care in hospice? Home care. Home, routine home care. RHC. Routine home care. Eighty percent of your patient days have to be RHC. What else? Respite. respite care. What is respite care? The caregiver burden. I mean, uh, so it's five you. days in an inpatient setting so that the family can get respite. Five days in how many days? Like how many times they can get five days? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. See that? That's a nuance I have to now look up. I've been doing this for seven years, looking up the nuances. Anybody know how many respite periods you have? I've heard it's one per, per certification period. Yeah, well, that would make sense. Yeah. But again, one, it's a... One it's a per three months. Like well, one per three months would not correspond with what Laurel said. So Laurel thinks it's one per cert period, and Dr. Eddy thinks it's one per three months. And since neither of you know for sure... Okay. Why don't we all agree we'll come back together in a year here, <laughs> right before Thanksgiving next year, and I'll tell you what the answer is. Or you can Google it. There is something called a Google machine, and you could put in a question, and they will tell you. So access to routine home care, access to respite care. What's a third level of care? Continuous care. What's continuous care? 24-7 in the home. Now, by the way, as far as hospice is concerned, nursing home and home are the same. Nursing home or residence is where you live. It's a home. So continuous care is 24-7 care by a nursing professional. And, and hospices have to provide continuous care. What about um, the last level of care? That's where we were. GIP. General inpatient level of care. What does general inpatient level of care mean? What justifies us telling Medicare that we're bringing a patient in the hospital for GIP level? Say it again. Best managed. Um, well, So there's a, the way that they would think about it is there's a need for skilled nursing or a need for medical services. So it's, it's actually very much the same as uh, part, B, part A, general hospital billing. It's what your DRG, it's like having a DRG, but instead of having a DRG, which is a, a bunch of money linked to a diagnosis that covers a certain number of days during which the government says you should finish taking care of that patient's medical needs. We actually get a per diem, but the government says you're only going to get the per diem if the patient has those medical needs. So it's skilled medical needs or skilled nursing needs, access to those required. And, what's a, and so that's, they say for symptom control and what we say, they say unrelieved symptom, we say unrelieved symptom or complication of disease. So a patient is, has to be admitted to the hospital for skilled nursing or, or medical input for, an un, uh, for a um, symptom control need or, or a complication of disease. What's the second reason that they can be GIP? Active dying, right, actively dying. 
So these are important, as we'll talk about in a second, in terms of reimbursement. Okay. So what are the venues of care? So the levels of care, routine home care, continuous care, respite care, GIP level care, four levels of care, four, le four different per diems set by the government, depending on where in the country you live. Documentation requiring evidence that the person is appropriate for those levels of care have to, has to be in the medical record. Right? If a patient is in our hospital here and we can't discharge the patient and they don't have, uh, they don't have an uncontrolled symptom or they're not actively dying, we are required by law to change the billing on that patient to routine home care. The patient is then in a hospital bed and parenthetically costing the hospice the rental of that bed at a hospital rate, but the hospice program is only billing the government for the routine home care. What's the routine home care per diem in New York here? Do you, anyone know? Say it again. Around 167, I've heard. It changes all the time, but say 167. Do you know what the GIP per diem is? Seven. It's about 785. So if you're a hospice uh, program and, and you have to pay seven something to the hospital to rent that bed, but you're getting 167, who counts beans here? That, the math doesn't work. So it's something you don't really want. Just that period. Just that period. Yeah, we have, it, it is the obligation of the, of the hospice agency to bill based on the level of care and to document that. Okay, so venues of care, we already said, in the home, which can be in a nursing home or a hospice residence, in the hospital, in an SRO. out system, the healthcare system in the United States. We'll have as many massive systems as possible, all duplicating the services that patients get. This is brilliant. The person who came up with this, just you have to, probably a Republican, I'm sorry. Um, anyway, so the answer, uh, what's the answer, Dr. Eddie? So, I think, yeah, yes, you can, but services Yeah. Yeah, to my knowledge, it's a certified hospice agency w providing a team in the prison. Prisons don't have their own agencies. Okay, um, very quickly, so these are the myths among others. There are many myths. Hospice is not a place. It's a home care program with access to beds. Uh, hospices can provide disease-modifying therapies. If you define the word curative as meaning prolonging life more than six months, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty. If you define the word curative like that, then hospice cannot provide curative therapies. If you define the word curative as meaning curing, then it's moot, because nothing we do in hospice for hospice patients cure them. So the word curative, it is true fact. If a patient is given a curative therapy, they are not eligible for hospice, because if you cure it, presumably you'll live more than six months. It's just it's just illogical to think about because the overwhelming majority of patients, except for the rare patient who has access to Gleevec, the overwhelming majority of patients will not be cured. So calling the therapies curative basically affects almost no one unless you redefine the word curative as meaning prolonging life more than six months. If you define the word curative as disease modifying, you become like most hospice agencies in the country. Uh, but unfortunately, that's taking a financial argument and giving it the glimmer of medical decision-making, which everybody does, but makes me uncomfortable, so don't do it. Makes me very uncomfortable to not be honest. I call, these pro I call them proxy words. You know, you go to meetings and you hear all these people saying things using words that don't mean 
what normal people would think they mean, you know, like curative. So, you know, I, I worked in a cancer hospital for 10 years. I never saw anybody with an advanced lung cancer get cured by chemotherapy. It doesn't happen. Um, do, do hospice programs require the patients to give up their primary physician? No. no. Common, common myth? Do patients in a hospice program have to be DNR? No. Common myth. Okay. What about the role of the physicians? There are three... There are three types of relationships if you're a physician or an NP, actually. There are three types of relationships that you may have with a hospice. So one type of relationship is called an attending physician. So an attending physician is... How would, do you know how the government defines the attending physician? This is apropos of what you were saying, Stephanie. So the government will not let you say what's curative, but the government will let you say who you're attending physician with. Whoever you appoint. Yeah, whoever you appoint. So a patient has the right to say, that's my attending physician. Now, how does the government decide, what, what does the government do with an attending physician? The government has the hospice agency put the attending physician's name into the computer that controls all the activities of Americans. You may think that you have free will, but you don't. We're all being controlled by computers out of Washington. Did you know that? It's true. That's true. Um, <laughs> and so as an attending physician, your name is in the computer. And what the computer says is, if I receive a bill, a Medicare bill, under a 15, so-called 1500 form, if I receive a Medicare bill, and it's a Part A bill for a Part B bill for a physician, right? Part B covers physician billing. I will not pay it unless I have the name of that person in the computer. I will only pay Part B bills for that one doctor or NP in the computer. That's that's who the attending physician is. The attending physician is the only physician interacting with a hospice patient who is allowed to bill, who, who will get paid, not allowed, anybody can bill anybody, but it's the only physician who will get paid when billing under a routine Part B billing system. Every other physician who drops a bill goes into their office and says to their secretary, you know, I need to, um, I need to bill Ms. Jones, uh, just electronically submit a bill for endoscopy. And that gastroenterologists say, puts a bill for endoscopy under Part B for Ms. Jones, who's a hospice patient. He gets an, explana an explanation of benefits saying rejected. And this is why a very large proportion of physicians, at least in the New York metro area, think that they don't get paid for hospice care. They think that taking care of hospice patients is pro bono work, is charity work. And this is not true. It's because if you, if you are not the designated attending, in quotes, the attending, you're only one. If you're not the designated attending and you bill the government, you bill Medicare, you will not get paid. So that's, that, so that's one type of physician. A second type of physician is called an employed physician. An employed physician is either a hospice medical director or a physician designee, a medical director designee. These are physicians who have contracts with the hospice and have a series of responsibilities as a medical director. Oversight, I don't have it here, sorry. Oversight, administrative responsibilities. The key, diff the key thing about an HMD or a designee is that they can sign CTIs. Right? So the, physi the, the, physi the employed physicians who are designated as hospice medical directors can sign patients into hospice. Now, can these physicians bill, hospice, bill uh, Medicare? Only for, yes, they can. But there are two issues, and they're really important. Issue number one is that they have to bill under Part A. If you have a contract with hospice, you're not billing under Part B anymore. Remember, anybody who bills under Part B is getting rejected except the attending. So you're billing under Part A, which means you bill the hospice. Number two, you can't bill for that part 
of physician services covered under the per diem. The government gives a per diem to the hospice agency, which includes medical services. It's right here in the COPS. Administration, oversight of the care plan, signing of documents like a CTI. If you bill for those, that's fraud. You can only bill for professional services that, re that require a physician's input and are outside of the administrative responsibilities of the hospice medical director. So if you go see a patient and adjust the pain medication, you can bill hospice, and the hospice will collect those funds, and they may or may not distribute it to you. That depends on the relationship with the hospice that you have. But if you bill for going to an IDT meeting, that's fraud. Or if the hospice agency, if you bill the hospice agency and the hospice agency then bills up through Part A for your time spent doing oversight, that's fraud. You have to see the patient for a bill, so-called billable physician service or billable MP service, and you have to document it's a billable service and bill into Part A using the same codes that we use in the Part B world. Use the same codes. What's the third kind of, third kind of person? Right. So it's a, they call it a contracted, contracted physician. I always think a contracted physician is like a little raisin physician, you know, somebody who's very dehydrated. So I like the word consultant. Consultant physicians need a contract with hospice, and they bill Part A, not Part B. If you're a consultant and you bill Part B, what happens? Denied. Denied. You're a consultant, you bill Part A, you're, you're, you get paid. However, the requirement is that what you offer the patient has to be part of the plan of care. So hospices, if they're feeling very tough, could, could deny consultants payment if they have not spoken to the medical director or the case manager about what they want to do first. And it doesn't appear in the record. So ideally, look, if, you want, if you're a consultant and you want to amputate a limb, I would suggest you talk to the medical director, you talk to the case manager, and the plan of care says amputation of limb. Then you bill hospice for the professional services related to that amputation, that surgical procedure, using the same CPT codes, and Medicare will pay you under Part A. Okay. And the role, the role of the HMD or the designee, as I said, these are, the, you have to keep this in mind, those of you who end up professionally doing at least part-time hospice work, this is under very intense scrutiny now, and it's going to get only worse. There are things that you will do as an HMD or as a designee of an HMD that are, are intended by law to be covered by the per diem. Hospice should be paying you a salary for that under the per diem, right? So if, you're an ID, if you attend an IDT, hospice might pay you $600 to attend an IDT. Or they might say for the, for the whole year of IDTs, we'll give you $10,000 or $20,000. That's your salary. We're paying, that salary is coming from our per diem because that per diem is covering that piece of your work. But that per diem doesn't cover you going to see a patient and offering a treatment for dyspnea or evaluating a patient for some other symptom. Okay? Family meetings are covered. Okay. So what's the economics of hospice? It should be pretty, um, pretty clear now. This is like any other managed care organization. The problem is that hospices are notorious for not managing care. Actually, it's sort of interesting because in New York State, managed care took over the healthcare system in New York State like it did in many other parts of the country, but managed care in New York State basically became discounted fee-for-service because the managed care companies never really managed care. And then the managed care companies began to insist on lots of pre-authorizations. And they, by and large, did not manage care. They just put in a barrier to try to reduce utilization. So managed care companies, in, in, at least in New York, have become discounted fee-for-service associated with a barrier to care. That's why we hate them. They're not actually managing the care. The goal of managed care organizations is to manage the care, to apply evidence-based medicine, best practices, and to try to get doctors to do best practice in, in an effort to reduce inappropriate use of expensive therapies. Managed care agencies do not manage care. Hospices are notorious for not managing care. But, but, and that's unfortunately what happens. Hospice agencies will tend to pay for whatever, or they set up these rules, like no curative therapy, and that applies to anything that affects the disease. 
So the economics of hospice are dicey because you, you get paid what the, the, one of the four per diems. 80% of the per diems are routine home care payment, and you have to pay the salaries of nurses, social workers, pastoral care providers, volunteer coordinators. You have to pay per diem or contract out to get dietary support, PT, OT. Home health aid services are required to be paid for. A piece of the, ph the physician's salary, a piece of the physician's time has to be paid for. You have to pay, if you have a contract with a facility like a hospital, you have to be able to pay for that. And, and, uh, and hopefully uh, you won't break the bank by doing that. So hospices have, to have, a, have difficulty breaking even unless, as I said before, you figure out that there are risk pool manipulation or risk pool management. By risk pool, we mean what? We mean it's a full risk benefit. So if you get paid for a person who doesn't require a lot of services, you make money. If you get paid for a patient who requires a lot of services, you lose money. Most of the money is spent when a hospice program first sets up care. And so if you have long lengths of stay patients who don't require a lot of care, you make money. Where do those patients live? Nursing homes. So hospices that make money tend to be hospices with large census and a high proportion of the census in nursing homes. And that can be very profitable. And the problem, of course, is when that becomes unjustified. You know, unjustified because they're not providing effort, they, they don't provide any effort to get patients out of the community, or they keep people on the program longer than eligibility would determine. And that's what the government is up in arms about. Um, and for physicians, the economics of most people who are uh, palliative medicine specialists involve a contract with hospice that allows you to be an employed physician. As an employed physician, you may or may not get a salary for attendance at an IDT and other administrative functions. I personally think you should. If you ever email me in the future and say they're not paying me, I will tell you, tell them to pay you. That's what the per diem is there for. They have to pay you. They can have either a per diem, a per diem relationship or a salary relationship. And in addition to that, that provides you with access to bill part A by seeing patients for billable medical services. Okay. Now, what's the length of stay in hospice nationally? What's the median length of stay in hospice? Two weeks. Not as bad as two weeks. It's 21 days. It's between 19 and 21 days, and it's been that way since the 80s. What proportion of patients in hospice are dead within seven days of admission to hospice? Seven? seven. seven. No, it's not that bad. About 25%. So, and, and remember, when you talk about hospice, it's admission and discharge, right? It's a completely different system of care. So it's admission and discharge. So in the United States, hospice, the, benefit, the hospice benefit and hospice services are uh, severely underutilized, even relative to how it, they were envisioned by the people who set them up in the 80s. Right? It was set up as a quote-unquote six-month benefit, acknowledging that physicians couldn't prognosticate, but figuring if they said six months, physicians would more or less get it right. They basically figured that they would be, the median would be about four months and there would be some people on longer than six months and some people on shorter than six months, and that's what, the, that's what the people who set up the benefit thought. And instead, what happened was a median length of stay of 21 days that hasn't changed in two and a half decades. And 25% of patients get admitted and they're dead within, 30, within seven days. So the way that the benefit was envisioned has not played out in that respect, and the rationale for that um, the reasons for that, there's no rationale, but the reasons for that probably relate to physicians not understanding the benefit, the stigma associated with the linkage between death and dying, the curative issue, the fact that medical care is expensive and small hospice programs have had to essentially uh, close the doors to any patient getting disease-modifying therapy using the excuse that it's curative even though it's not curative, but they say it's outside of our 
ability to take you because you're getting curative therapy. When you give up curative therapy, you can come in. Telling an American that they have to give up something to cure them, telling anybody, is first of all, not good. Not good communication, right? Because you're telling patients, you're using words that people understand in a different way than they can possibly actually mean. So it's not fair to the patient to say, you know, when you give up curative therapy, you can come in. Well, patients hear the word curative, and that's not what's happening. But that's the way hospice programs largely work. So because hospice programs have closed the door, physicians have not had the discussion with, with patients about these services to provide comprehensive care, because physicians misunderstand what the nature of the benefit is, and they think it's a place you go to die as opposed to a comprehensive home care program and because of the link with death and dying, which makes people in the United States nervous, you have a benefit that's profoundly underused. And that's, so that's really part of the specialty of palliative care and palliative medicine. It is to try to use the benefit more effectively without, without violating the rules of the road. Compliance is a key goal, right? Compl you have to be compliant with the regulations. There's no, there's no um, wiggle room on that. Medical directors and case managers are sometimes worried that they're being pushed to bring people onto a program or into a hospital setting when, they're not, when they can't document that it's the right thing to do based on the regs. Uh, you know, frankly, if an agency does that, the professionals involved should think about leaving. The good agencies will never do that will never do that. And I can tell you from working in our agency, Metropolitan Jewish, or NJHS, Hospice and Palliative Care, since June, that's been my requirement, that you don't sign your name unless you're comfortable signing it. And there's total support at every level within the organization for that. So the bottom line is that we have to be in compliance, but that doesn't mean we have to support the underuse of the benefit. So we have to try to change the culture of care. Okay, so... What questions do you have? What comments do you have? Yeah, Rishi. In terms of the levels of care where you said routine home care is 80%, you have to use 20%. Does that refer to the whole census of the hospital? Yes. Okay. Is, is it one year, two letters, days, or 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 one year, two letters, in for a year, that's 100 times 365, which is whatever that is. Right. No more than 20% of those days can be GIP. Right. And if they are more than GIP, the agency has to pay back the government. So the small hospice programs are also at another disadvantage. They have obviously a lot, you know, a lot of our patient populations after they collect the benefits, you know, they come and they have short days and that's what they utilize. You know, I, I think it's I think it's a it's an interesting thing to think about. I haven't heard that. Uh, the question the question was, since the actively dying patient, even in hospice programs, are more often in the inpatient unit getting GIP. If the lengths of stay are very short in large numbers of patients, you may get above the 20% of days being GIP. And I, I guess it's a risk, but I haven't heard that as being an issue. Right. Yeah, we're, we're high in New York, and in fact, we're high in MJHS, which is one of the reasons that we get probed. You know, there are, there are so-called filters that the fiscal intermediary uses to decide on probing. And when we were continuum hospice care, and even now, there, there's a concern. But with continuum hospice care, it wasn't a concern. It was a reality. We actually got probed for compliance solely on the basis of the proportion of patients who were inpatient because we were above 10%. And so, you know, it is what it is. In New York, given the environment out there, there's going to be more GIP. Yes? What qualifies somebody for the, um, the continuous care level as opposed to the regular? 
what, uh, the question is what qualifies somebody for continuous care. So it's just the clinical judgment that somebody's needed 24-7. It's typically in the act of dying situation. That's one of the, you know, continuous care regime is used a lot more in other hospice, hospice agencies to keep people at home, to allow home death. That's one of the ways you keep the GIP level down. Can be continuous yeah, care. That's be. that I don't know. Does anybody know that? In the past, uh, you know, if you're like hospice medical director, you would be told um, the continuous we can provide continuous uh, level of care in like the final couple of days of life to make sure patients are comfortable. But now, when the metropolitan Jewish and some big hospice programs may allow you to provide it up to a week. Yeah, we've actually provided it for more than a week in a case-by-case -case basis. So I'm, I don't think that the regulations stipulate how long, but we, we'll look that up. It's another one for the Google machine. So that doesn't apply to the 80-20? That's just a separate data? Yes, that's not 80-20. The, the 20 percent only applies to GIP level care, so not continuous care. Okay, so let's go admit patients to hospice.